So Dr. Scholz, in a previous video, we kind of covered the overview of what Gleason 4 plus 3 equals 7 looks like, kind of with the difference between 3 and 4 versus 4 and 3. But today I want to talk about treatments. So being in that category, I think a lot of people have concern that the number 4 is first and that the Gleason score is higher and therefore they can no longer do, maybe they were thinking of active surveillance. I think a lot of people wonder if they can do active surveillance in this case. So why can't patients do active surveillance in 4 plus 3? Well, yeah, it's not typically recommended to do active surveillance with 4 plus 3. Uh, there certainly are exceptions. The reason, of course, is that uh, 3 doesn't spread, 4 can spread. And that, of course, is a defining issue, is whether or not the cancer spreads. If it doesn't spread, it's really a harmless benign tumor. If it does spread, now it's starting to behave like a cancer. The um, uh, empiric idea then that anyone with 4 plus 3 must be treated is reasonably well grounded. Uh, the exceptions would be in people that have, uh, that are somewhat older, um, people who have um, perhaps very small amounts of 4 and have other favorable uh, characteristics, and s specifically, of course, in people that have negative PSMA PET scans that don't show any spread. But uh, it would still be unorthodox to be monitoring 4 plus 3. Everything in the decision about treatment versus observation is based on, well, how noxious is the treatment? If we can come up with a rather simple treatment that doesn't cause lasting harm to the uh, sexual and urinary function, then you know the arguments for doing active surveillance are near not nearly as strong. So it's uh, all about a calculation of the risk of spread and the implications of spread on quality of life uh, versus uh, the implications of the uh, treatment impacting quality of life. So let's say that someone with a Gleason 4 plus 3 goes and gets a PET scan and they find that the cancer is localized to the prostate. How do you determine what are the next steps for treatment? Well, of course, it depends on the patient's goals. If, uh, if you have a somewhat elderly patient who's no longer sexually active, I would tend to steer them towards some sort of simple radiation. Uh, the cure rates are going to be very high, and in centers of excellence now, they're, um, you know, and with the use of space ore, there's really relatively little damage uh, as a result of the treatment other than the possibility of erectile dysfunction. So in uh, people that are younger, well, of course, the issue would be, uh, is there... Um, is the disease unilateral? Would it be amenable to some sort of focal therapy? Uh, we've had good results with focal brachytherapy. Um, Tulsa Pro is starting to pick up momentum and looking good for focal therapy. And the incidence of erectile dysfunction from focal therapy is quite a bit reduced over treating the whole prostate. And then if people have bilateral disease, then they're sort of uh, obligated to be thinking of some sort of whole prostate treatment, usually some sort of brachytherapy. Uh, with or without some supplemental hormones uh, or possibly prophylactic radiation to their pelvic lymph nodes. All these things are basically projections on how likely is it that there's some disease outside, even though the PSMA PET scan shows that it's clear. So you mentioned, you know, it matters where, how many um, tumors there are and where they are at. So can you kind of describe the prostate and the different sections and what you would prescribe focal therapy for in those situations? There's been so much new technology in the last 10, 15 years that allows us to define where the cancer is inside the prostate. And uh, historically, there's been a lot of uncertainty about that. And for uh, good reasons, and as a precaution, the whole prostate is treated as a standard. It's uh, the idea of doing focal therapy was not thought to be feasible because you, there was uncertainty as to whether there would be other tumors or unexplained cancers in corners of the gland that were missed. And that uh, was based in the uh, proposition that almost everyone was diagnosed on the basis of a random biopsy. And we knew that random biopsies were missing uh, significant cancer about 20% of the time. So you don't want to go in and do a partial treatment and then be left with a mess later that you can't fix. But uh, we have much better technology now for localizing cancer within the prostate with uh, three Tesla, you know, multiparametric MRIs, and now with PSMA PET scans, uh, you can be quite confident that you know where the cancer is. So all you're left with now is the need for an expert who's good at uh, targeting that area of the gland with an appropriate margin, and uh, thus focal therapy is quite feasible. And if men do develop a new cancer in the untreated prostate, then an additional focal treatment can be administered to that area of the prostate as well. So focal therapy is a very reasonable proposition in people who have been carefully uh, staged with the appropriate uh, methodologies. 
and who have access to a, a maven who's really developed skills for doing focal therapy. And uh, it's all dependent on knowing uh, exactly where the, the, the tumor is within the prostate. So how do you suggest that someone finds a maven who is skilled in focal therapy? I think it's by reputation, uh, word of mouth. Probably the patient support groups are the uh, a good resource for people where they uh, are in a certain community where they know the kinds of outcomes that their doctors are delivering. And also, of course, online reviews, I think, have value. Those, I know they can be manipulated to some degree, but I still think they're useful. So as far as the side effects of focal therapy compared to other forms of radiation, I would imagine that focal therapy is a lot less. What side effects for radiation in general, if you're doing the whole prostate, can they expect? Well, there's an age-dependent risk of erectile dysfunction. So with whole prostate radiation therapy, if you take a 65-year-old who's not using any Viagra or Cialis prior to the uh, onset of the radiation, you're looking at about a 30-35% chance of serious erectile dysfunction uh, subsequent to the radiation that, uh, you know, appearing within the next year or two uh, that will not respond to Cialis or Viagra. So that uh, that's that risk will go even higher in 75 and 70 and 75 year olds. And it'll be somewhat less in 50 and 55 year olds. What about HIFU? This is like marketed a lot in the world of prostate. Well, it's, it's an operator dependent procedure, just like any radiation or surgery. So finding someone that's very good at it is important. Insurance coverage has been a little spotty, so it can be more expensive. Uh, HIFU, I think, is adapts reasonably well to focal therapy. Uh, so if the doctor has skills in you know, uh, localizing the tumor and, and uh, has good uh, accuracy with their administration. HIFU can work very nicely for, um, for focal therapy. Tulsa Pro is a, a modified type of HIFU. Typical HIFU is administered through the rectal wall from the rectum into the prostate. Uh, Tulsa Pro is administered through the urethra out into the gland. So the urethra is in the middle of the prostate and the the uh, HIFU fires out from the urethra. The advantage of the Tulsa Pro is that it's done uh, directly under MRI vision, so they can see where they're going when they're doing the treatment. So, uh, so there's a lot of potential arguments in favor of Tulsa Pro. The, it's new, and so the doctors are still in their learning curve, but uh, it looks very hopeful going forward. Are there any urinary issues or scar tissue issues with Tulsa Pro? Tulsa Pro can be repurposed uh, for the treatment of BPH because uh, as men get older, they get compression on the urethra and the Tulsa Pro, which fires out from the urethra, can actually open up the urinary passageway. Uh, so it could actually lead to help men who are struggling with urinary problems due to their BPH as they get older. So I think the biggest question that patients have when it comes to these specific types of cases is what are our survival rates? Well, modern survival rates with Gleason 4 plus 3 in men that have been diagnosed through screening with PSA are incredibly good. I, I would say that the 10-year survival rate uh, for properly treated, diagnosed and treated people is in the range of 99%. Who is the 1%? Uh, there are freakish, unusual, uh, strange types of prostate cancer that can behave uh, uh, in a very aggressive fashion, but they're rare. Uh, most of these men are gonna get cured, and, uh, and the small percentage that aren't cured are going to be controllable for 10 to 20 years with hormone treatment. So how would your opinion for treatments change if somebody has seminal vesicle invasion? Well, if there's seminal vesicle invasion in the old days, we used to think, well, that's a high risk of spread to other parts of the body. But now with PSMA PET scans, we can rule out that proposition. So uh, people with seminal vesicle invasion just need a skillful doctor who knows how to cover the seminal vesicles with radiation or whatever form of treatment that's being administered. So it doesn't have the same uh, frightening implications that we... Uh, we applied to seminal vesicle invasion in the past because we have better technology through PSMA PET scans to know if there's anything beyond in the lymph nodes, for example. So PSMA PET scan will say, you, yes, there is a lymph node metastasis, or no, there isn't a lymph node metastasis. In the past, all we had were CAT scans and MRIs, and so we would see seminal vesicle invasion, and we'd say, well, there could be lymph node metastasis, but we don't really know, so we have to take extra precautions given the fact that there's a higher risk of lymph node metastasis when you have seminal vesicle invasion. So I've heard patients who have had seminal vesicle invasion and their doctor is automatically putting them on hormone therapy for the fear of metastasis. So would you say with PSMA scans that they don't have to do this? Well, I think it, 
it becomes part of the conversation. The whole staging and treatment milieu has been radically altered by the advent of PSMA PET scans. We know that uh, hormone therapy has uh, noxious side effects and that sometimes can be lingering lifelong. And so uh, it's not a small decision to take away a man's testosterone. Uh, we do know that it's an efficacious treatment, and of course it's considered routine in anyone with proven lymph node disease. Um, it, it works, it saves lives, but in men that don't have proven lymph node disease, uh, what are we to do? We don't have long-term studies. Uh, I think it just needs to be explained to patients that uh, cure rates can probably be enhanced to a modest degree with the use of hormone therapy, but when people hear about the potential side effects of the hormone therapy, they may decide that the improvement, the small improvement in cure rates may not, may not be justified. So saying someone had uh, radiation and the doctor treated the seminal vesicles and they had a PSMA, there's no other signs. How frequent should those PSMA scans be after the form of radiation to make sure it isn't metastasizing somewhere? Yeah, we're not routinely doing PSMA PET scans in men that have very low PSA levels after treatment. PSA at very low levels is a strong and accurate indication that the disease is completely in check. But uh, if someone starts to develop a rising PSA, uh, even above 0 0.2, 0 0.3, it's easy to do these scans and, and why not double check? But uh, many of these men are, after radiation now, um, living with undetectable PSAs and I don't see any reason to be doing routine PSMA PET scans in those individuals. I think oftentimes when people are writing in, they're wondering why we're not talking about surgery as an option, especially when you're in this Gleason grade four plus three and there's a four present. So why aren't you a fan of surgery? Uh, the side effects, uh, the finest surgeons, uh, and there's a number of really excellent ones out there, really can't guarantee you that you'll have control of your urine after surgery. They'll say it's unlikely that you'll be incontinent, but uh, even the finest surgeons, number of studies have shown that there's a five to 10% chance that you're gonna end up with serious incontinence for life after surgery. What's not talked about is that uh, there's a much higher incidence of stress incontinence, meaning when you cough, jump, or laugh, you s squirt a little urine, and that's up to about 50% even with good surgeons. And sadly, of course, then there's a condition called climacteria, where men during sexual activity will actually ejaculate urine. So these uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, you know, su surgery side effects are completely avoidable with radiation, and surgery can't promise you higher cure rates. The cure rates are uh, probably comparable or uh, certainly no better than what can be achieved with modern radiation. Why all the enthusiasm for surgery? Well, historically, radiation was much worse. Uh, the technology with radiation has evolved radically in the last 10, 15 years so that they, have, they are now on par with cure rates with surgery without the side effects. But if you go back 10, 15 years, you wouldn't want to go near radiation because of the really scary, bad, permanent burns that were happening. And the, and the lower cure rates that were happening. So radiation therapy is trying to overcome a bad reputation, which was well-deserved if you go back 15, 20 years ago. Uh, but as of with modern technology, is not at all deserved. It's a, it's a completely new world. Thanks for talking about that. We have some viewers who have seen our channel and know your viewpoints on surgery, but if somebody's you know, coming to this video for the first time, we definitely wanted to mention that. Thank you so much for watching this video on Gleason 4 Plus 3. We know that there are a lot of intricate details when it comes to your prostate cancer case, and we want to help you break that down. Please remember that the research that you do outside of that doctor's office is greatly going to affect what happens inside that doctor's office. Write your questions ahead of time. I know you're tired of me saying it, but I cannot tell you how important this is. You guys have like 10 to 15 minutes, maybe if you're lucky, 30 minutes with your physician usually. And a lot of times when we're in that moment, we don't remember everything we're dealing with outside of that office. So please write that questions down, take somebody with you, and remember that your quality of life matters. So ask the questions you may be even intimidated to ask. We understand that they're medical professionals and you may feel like you're the patient, but oftentimes you've researched more about your case than that doctor has. And it's not anything to the doctors. We respect them, we love them, we appreciate all the hard work that they're doing and their expertise. Obviously they're there to help us. But the biggest person who's gonna have the most impact in your medical team is you. So thank you so much for your time. PCRI is always here for you. Go ahead and call us if you have questions. You can see our website at PCRI.org to submit that. And leave your comments and your topics and your questions in the uh, comment section below this video. This really helps us develop our content and give us a thumbs up if you like this video. This helps us to make more.